Hello, friends. Welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Before we start, let's inspire ourselves, as always, for the discussion ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, friends, if you're joining us on C-SPAN Live, please check out all of the NCC's great America's Town Hall programs. We have some wonderful ones coming up next month. Uh, on December 4th, we'll talk about the history of the Espionage Act and the First Amendment. On December 11th, Robert Post of Yale Law School will introduce his wonderful new Holmes device on the Taft Court. I can't wait to discuss that with him. And on December 13th, we'll have a discussion of the origins of partisanship during the American Revolution. And you can always hear these shows on our live podcast, live at the NCC, and also on our weekly podcast of constitutional debate, We the People. And now it is a great honor to introduce our panel on an extremely significant topic, which is populism and democracy in America. Francis Lee is jointly appointed in the Department of Politics and the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, where she's professor of politics and public affairs at Princeton University. She's the author of many books, including most recently, The Limits of Party, Congress, and Lawmaking in a Polarized Era. Stephen Levitsky is David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government at Harvard University. He is the co-author of two New York Times bestsellers, including How Democracies Die, and most recently, the book that we'll be focusing on today, Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point. And Kurt Wayland is the Mike Hogg Professor in Liberal Arts in the Department of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. He's the author of many books, including most recently his forthcoming book, uh, which we'll be discussing, Democracy's Resilience to Populism's Threat. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining Francis Lee, Stephen Levitsky, and Kurt Whalen. Uh, Steve Levitsky, let's begin uh, with you, if we may, in your new book, Why uh, Tyranny of the Minority, Why American Democracy Reached the Breaking Point, you argue that the threats to democracy are even worse than you imagined when you wrote Why Demo How Democracies Die in 2018. And you say that uh, part of those threats comes from the minoritarian features of the US Constitution, which allows partisan minorities to routinely thwart majorities and sometimes even govern them. Tell us why you believe that the most imminent threat facing us today is minority rule. I'm not sure it's the most imminent threat. I think we also face a threat of uh, sheer uh, instability, uh, a, a period in which we slide in and out of pretty severe constitutional crisis, uh, and that could be accompanied by by a fair amount of of violence. So minority rule is is one threat, and we can we can talk about it, but it's it may not be the most imminent one. Um, our book very very briefly takes on two big questions. Why, first of all, why? A, um, a mainstream political party, one that's com com competed peacefully in elections for more than 150 years, would suddenly go off the rails and suddenly turn away from democracy. That's actually a really rare event. Um, and so uh, it, a democracy cannot remain stable if one of two major parties is not fully committed to playing by democratic rules of the game. And when we wrote How Democracies Die, just uh, six years ago, we did not consider the Republican Party to be a, a, an anti-democratic party. We think we thought that it had made a uh, a, a major um, error in in sort of in gatekeeping error in allowing Donald Trump to to be its nominee. But we didn't consider the party to be uh, anti-democratic. But since 2020, 2021, the Republican Party has violated what we consider sort of the three basic tenets of democratic behavior for political parties. One, uh, accept the results of elections, win or lose. Two, unambiguously reject political violence. And three, break completely and unambiguously 
with anti-democratic extremist forces. When mainstream political parties of the center left or the center right do not do those three things, democracy gets into trouble. And since 2020, the bulk of the Republican Party has not been committed to those three things. Second half of the book, very quickly, has to do with our institutions, as you mentioned, Jeff. Um, the, the You can find throughout advanced Western democracies a uh, plurality of the electorate, a minority of the electorate, 25, 30, maybe 35 percent, maybe a third of the electorate that is sort of on the illiberal right. But only in the United States has that one third of the electorate translate, uh, been able to, to govern on its own and been able to begin to threaten democracy on its own. Um, and that, we think, is, is due to a set of excessively counter-majoritarian institutions that, unlike any other established Western democracy, allows partisan minorities, as you said, to systematically thwart and occasionally even govern over majorities. This, uh, is, and these go back. Most of these uh, institutions are constitutional. The Electoral College is one. The structure of the U.S. Senate is another. Some are not constitutional, uh, the, the Senate filibuster. But these add up to a system in which minorities can thwart majorities in ways that you don't see in any other established democracy. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Francis Lee, in your article on democracy and populism, you uh, take a more optimistic view and you argue that although uh, populist insurgency threatens the inclusive norms of liberal democracy in the US as it does elsewhere, the same features of the US system that impede its responsiveness to national popular majorities, federalism, bicameralism, and separate elections for national offices also help insulate the United States against a would-be authoritarian leader's centralized control. Tell us why you believe that uh, populist insurgency is more likely to be checked in the US than it is in other systems. Thanks for the question. I, I see um, our political system as one that's designed for circumstances Circumstances when, in the words of the Federalist Papers, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. It's a, it's a system that was very suspicious of concentrated power. So it has a, a whole series of institutions that have the effect of fragmenting power. So uh, a system of extensive system of checks and balances, including uniquely strong bicameralism. Layered on top of that are staggered elections, which tend to operate so that presidents uh, uh, you know, suffer a, a referendum on their performance two years in, one that routinely dilutes their strength um, in the legislature. Uh, federalism uh, 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 adds to this uh, fragmentation of power. Presidents, um, governing parties at the national level routinely face states controlled by the opposing party. And uh, federal state cooperation is generally necessary for uh, all important domestic policy making. So uh, it, this is another way in which uh, uh, power is checked in the, in the uh, American political system. You have a national government of limited powers, so uh, which uh, then in turn entails a great deal of litigation about where those boundaries are and uh, uh, the role of an independent judiciary in policing those boundaries uh, and a rigid constitution that's very difficult to change. So all of these all of these uh, factors um, make it uh, uh, less likely that you'd see an authoritarian concentration of power, even under the circumstances when a, a populist leader um, gains the reins of power. Now there are numerous trade-offs involved with a political system designed this way. Uh, it often prevents decisive leadership, especially especially in the domestic realm. Uh, gridlock is not unusual in American politics. A high bar of consensus is generally necessary for, uh, for major legislation. But it's a system that's pretty well designed to check the excesses of a populist leader. Now, unfortunately, we combine a system like this with a party system that has no such protections, you know, radically open nominations process. There's nothing to stop 
racist or ethno-nationalist forces from taking over one of the uh, major parties. And there's a there's a, a, a limit to what um, uh, you know national party leaders can do to uh, affect who receives uh, party nominations in a system this radically open, uh, 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 it, remarkably open in comparative terms. So populists can get nominated in in, uh, in American politics, the presidential level at the congressional level, uh, but they will be checked um, in office uh, due to uh, the, the basic structure of the constitutional system. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Kurt Whalen, in chapter six of your forthcoming book, you argue that uh, many of the features of the American system, in particular the tripartite separation of powers enshrined in the presidential system of government, uh, continues to impose firm constraints on the head of state that impede any serious power grab by what you call a personalistic plebiscitarian leader, and that's an important part of your definition of, of a populism leader, of a populist leader, and you say all of those features in the U.S. Uh, limited the degree to which uh, President Trump was able to subvert uh, liberal democratic institutions in his first term. Tell us more about that. So <clears throat> when you look at the U.S. case, you see that um, a number of the features of this tripartite separation of powers played a very important role in reining in what Trump could do. The judiciary, for example, that was invoked very frequently and that blocked a number of Trump's initiatives. And Trump actually, <clears throat> despite his transgressive tendencies, complied with judicial rulings. Federalism, not only in the challenges that state governors and mayors posed to Trump's initiatives, but also federalism, of course, prevents the federal government from having complete control over the electoral system. And so when you think of the challenges that Trump posed to elections after his defeat, he would have gone much, gotten much farther if there hadn't been um, state control over the electoral system. And so in a number of ways, you know, you see that, for example, Senate Republicans are less in line with President Trump's initiatives, have blocked some of them, um, dragged their feet more than the House. And so bicameralism, I think, played an important role. I also come, come to that, of course, from my perspective as a comparative politics scholar, because what you see is when you look at the country, the richest, most advanced country that recently moved to authoritarian rule under a populist, that is Hungary. And one way how, how um, Viktor Orban could do this in Hungary with surprising ease is that it's a very majoritarian democracy and um, doesn't have the tripartite separation of powers that is nearly as clear and made change of the constitution fairly easy. In here, Viktor Orban can easily, with almost perfect legality, dismantle a democracy. So by compare contrast to international experiences, you, you see the importance of the tripartite separation of powers in the United States. And, and just one last point um, from a comparativist perspective that also from the perspective of a foreigner that Americans often, I think, don't see that much. I think that the United States tight constraints on presidential leadership is one reason why the United States is the country that has maintained a liberal democratic system for the longest time in the world. You know, no other country has achieved that for 236 years. Americans often take that for granted and forget about it. But of course, constraints on presidential power limit the, in some sense, the most dangerous actor that can um, undermine democracy from the inside and it lowers the stakes of politics. And all of that, I think, helps with the stability and survival of a democratic system. And I think that's often not sufficiently appreciated that despite all the troubles and travails that American democracy has undergone during those more than two centuries, you know, you're the one country that has really maintained democracy for such a long time. And I think that is partly due to that tightly balanced, checked and balanced institutional system. So. Thank you so much for that. Well, Steve Lubitsky, I'm so eager to hear your uh, response to your two colleagues. I know that you are all uh, friends and indeed you and, and Professor Lee were, were students of Kurt Whalen. So this is very much a, a friendly um, uh, di difference of views, but you've heard your colleagues argue that it was constitutionalism that prevented President Trump from descending further into authoritarianism in his 
uh, first term. You, you argue in your new book that, that both those counter-majoritarian diff- uh, uh, features make it easier for an authoritarian to win, and then once in office, easier to dismantle liberal norms. Uh, tell us why you think that you're right and, and, and you're not convinced by their arguments. Look, I actually agree with them in uh, in many res- important respects. First of all, the United States has uh, very strong institutions, a very effective rule of law, as both Francis and Kirk pointed out, a uh, robust federalism and a strong independent judiciary, which um, so so it, it is very difficult to kill U.S. democracy. Um, and the fact that that Donald Trump, particularly given that he did not fully control his party, didn't kill U.S. democracy in in uh, in four years is um, probably should not surprise us. Our, our institutions did, in fact. Uh, model through and, pre- and prevent a personalization of power. Um, no question about it. A couple of points. First of all, m- my concern, our concern in, in the second book uh, is less a personalist or populist plebiscitarian leader than a, a political party that has turned away from democracy, which I think can do more damage than an individual leader, particularly if it gains control of uh, of national institutions, um, and the 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 counter the 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 process that concerns me. First of all, it, institutions are very important and and playing a you know, very important role in defending our democracy. But democracy can be threatened through our regime institutions, but also through other channels, including the state and society and some of the most troubling some of the some of the threats that we have to watch are not so much from the congress or the supreme court but rather from society and from transformations of the state um in terms of society one of the one of the very troubling signs in recent years um because u.s democracy has not remained intact over the last six or seven years all major uh, global democracy indices register a decline in the overall level of U.S. democracy uh, over the last uh, six, seven years in a way that is different from all of Western Europe. Um, wh- one thing that concerns me a lot is the level of violence that's occurring from below. So one of the in- one of the most fascinating revelations of Mitt Romney's recent biography, but something that I confirmed in interviews with other retired Republican Congress people is that Republican politicians now routinely make decisions based on fear and and threats from uh, from their so-called base. So when the decision to either convict uh, or acquit Donald Trump in the Senate is influenced by fear of violence, um, that's not especially democratic, and that's a process of societal radicalization that's operating outside of our institutions. With respect to the state, um, we we have a pretty effective civil service and that civil service did us a lot of good during the Trump presidency. Um, But it's possible for a, um, given the, 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 the growth of the administrative state over the last century, for an elected president outside or largely outside of the, of the Congress or with, particularly with the, the support of one's party, to purge and pack the state and begin to wield it against opponents. Now, Trump did not do that much, uh, thank God, during his first presidency, but he has made a, abundantly clear that he plans to do that um, in his second term. How much he will get away with is very, very difficult to say. Uh, again, I think our institutions will remain strong and the most vibrant defender, I think, protector of of our democracy is less our institutions than the strength of the political opposition, uh, which makes us very, very different from, from, say, Hungary. Um, But uh, in in general, I agree with both Francis and Kurt that U.S. institutions are strong and that counter-majoritarian institutions help to check the power of individual leaders. Um, but there are areas in which the United States is excessively counter-majoritarian that have nothing to do with protecting us 
from authoritarian plebiscitary leaders. So the Electoral College does not, it, Hamilton thought it might, but he was wrong. Uh, the Electoral College does nothing to protect us from authoritarian leaders. Um, a severely malapportioned Senate uh, does not necessarily protect us from uh, from plebiscitary leaders. So there, I think there are some checks and balances that are absolutely essential to democracy. It needs to be difficult. It should be difficult to reform the Constitution. That was one of the problems in Hungary is that it was too easy to reform the Constitution. Two-thirds of a single legislative body is too low a bar, in my opinion. Uh, the United States Constitution is much harder to, to, to change. Um, so some kind of majority institutions are absolutely essential. But we need to, to separate essential kind of majoritarian institutions from non-essential ones and ones that can, in fact, be deleterious or at least antithetical to democracy. And unfortunately, the United States has a number in this latter category. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Francis Lee, in, in helping us understand uh, areas of agreement and disagreement, uh, help us understand your definition of populism and the role that you say it's played in American history. You define populism as uh, an effort to um, empower executives, weaken checks and balances, restrict civil liberties, manipulate electoral institutions to cement their power against challenges, and appeals uh, against an elite in the name of a homogenous people. And you say throughout American history, starting with Andrew Jackson, it's operated within the framework of the American party system rather than fundamentally threatening the liberal order. Uh, tell us why you think that's the case and, and why you believe that uh, even a, a second Trump term might continue to operate within that liberal order rather than fundamentally threatening it. It is interesting. Like that was one of the first contrasts I noted um, when I began to study the comparative literature on populism during the Trump era. That Americanists, um, in reflecting on um, uh, popul populist um, leadership, had seen uh, populism as a, a democratizing force, uh, as a, a, a way of involving more of the people uh, in uh, uh, self government. That uh, it, it had a, it, there was a very, I'd say, neutral or even positive valence towards populism in the literature uh, uh, that uh, American politics scholars had produced on populism. It was relative, it's a relatively small literature, but um, at any rate, you know, the, 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 the great populist leaders of American history are often uh, portrayed in a positive light, including even, including even Andrew Jackson with uh, his, his uh, at best ambiguous history, uh, you know, as we might look at it now, has historically been presented in rather heroic terms. So, so the, it, it, that, it, that contrast was quite notable and, and it was why I found the comparative literature so helpful in understanding how populism presents a threat to democratic institutions that all of those um uh, all, all of those corrosive uh, uh, effects of populism were had been uh, that we observed during the trump years uh, the disrespect for institutions including even electoral institutions um the disrespect for civil liberties like all of that is characteristic of populist rule um, and you know, it was was part of the literature long before um, the the uh, you know Trump uh, rode down that golden elevator and declared himself uh, for uh, president of the United States. So I I found it very helpful to 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 take in that um, broader global perspective on on those on those questions. Um, but uh, uh, you know, as, as discussed, I see American institutions as helpful as resilient against some of the. Um, most important threats that populism can uh, can pose. Uh, Kurt uh, Whalen, um, when we we're talking about institutions and and the degree to which populist leaders can threaten them and as a result disrespect civil liberties, um, uh, um, both uh, in a in a Trump uh, second term. Uh, the president has, uh, the former president has said that he would uh, attack the deep state, centralize power in the executive, uh, go after enemies and use the Justice Department to uh, ensure uh, 
his will. Do, um, do, you, or do you believe that the institutions would hold the second time? So um, this is all in line with a unitary executive theory, which is a problem, right? And so um, Trump was not prepared for the resistance he got from what he called the deep state and will try to purge the deep state much more than before. And that is of concern because the Department of Justice is not really insulated from the executive institutionally. And so I think that would be, from my perspective, one of the big problems and risks of a second Trump presidency that he wish would push much harder and much stronger in the direction. But there still is, for example, an independent judiciary. So think, for example, many populist leaders, they try to use administrative mechanisms in order to put pressure on their opposition. You know, so opposition politicians suddenly are uh, discovered to have engaged in corruption, of course, government government politicians never do. And then you have like the IRS going after them. But I think the judiciary in the United States would block any kind of very discriminatory use of the law in that way. And so you might, you, you would probably in the second Trump term have less um, resistance insulation, foot dragging from the deep state, but there's still other lines of defense out there, the judiciary, federalism, Congress, civil society that in the United States is very vibrant. And on the one, you know, Trump learns, but of course his opponents learn as well to use um, ways of challenging, limiting him. You know, when you think of it, even during the first Trump term, you see that virtually every one of his initiatives was challenged in the courts. And it seems that courts, especially with democratically nominated judges were happy to block him and to limit him. And so, you know, while Trump might learn, his opponents might also learn. The other point is, but I don't, I'm not an American politics specialist, but of course, Trump in his second term would in principle be a lame duck, right? Because he can't get reelected. And the charismatic authority on which populist leaders draw is not easily transferable. He couldn't easily anoint a successor. And so you would assume that already during his second term, his political clout might actually diminish. And, you know, the maneuvering for who, who could succeed him would already start. And so while on the one hand, he has learned institutional strategies in political terms, I would assume that his cloud might actually be lower than during the first term. And so there would be a certain balance in that respect. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Steve Levitsky, your chapter three, It Happened Here, begins with a dramatic story in Wilmington, North Carolina, where uh, reconstruction is violently thwarted by the emergence of uh, a, a party uh, where um, uh, there's a refusal to enforce uh, federal law. Uh, black voting rights are destroyed. Uh, black people are murdered without remedy. And uh, this white government union club uh, on election day terrorizes uh, black neighborhoods, stuff the ballots, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, black voting uh, disappears for nearly a, a hundred years. Um, tell us about the significance of this story and, and what it teaches us about the nature of the populist threat. Th these were minority, lo local mobs that were refusing to enforce federal law. And it was the reluctance of the national government to pass the Force Act that Henry Cabot law Lodge proposed and to enforce the Reconstruction Amendments that let it happen. And, and, and what is the fact that uh, the rule of law in America has been threatened by local mob illiberal majorities say about the way that populism, uh, minority populism threatens constitutionalism? Well, interestingly, getting back to Francis's point, the, uh, the populists in this case in North Carolina were on the other side. The populists were aligned with the Republicans in uh, in founding uh, a very, very fragile multiracial democracy in, in North Carolina uh, in, the, in the late 19th century. Um, the, uh, the, the Democrats were really in no sense populist at that, at that time. They were authoritarian. Um, we think that that period, the, the, the Wilmington coup and, and the failure of Reconstruction is important in a couple of senses. First of all, it's important to remind, mo most Americans don't know a heck of a lot 
about Reconstruction and the failure of Reconstruction. Uh, it's it's really important historically for a couple of reasons. One, it was our country's first experiment with multiracial democracy, multiracial male democracy anyway. Um, and, and second, it was a period in which the United States uh, suffered some pretty ugly political outcomes. Um, violent terrorism, uh, coups, violent seizures of power, election fraud, uh, and and substantial amounts of extrajudicial killing. Um, so when we talk about 236 years of, of labor, liberal democracy, that actually isn't so. The U.S. South was quite authoritarian for nearly a century, uh, which had uh, important implications for our, our national political regime. By the, by the middle of the 20th century, the United States was considerably less democratic than most Western democracies. Um, the other reason why I think that that period is very important, though, is, um, as I said earlier, it's very rare that established political parties that have been competing peacefully in elections turn away from democracy. We, Daniel and I are comparativists. We have a fair amount of experience with in, in countries um, in two different regions of the world. And we actually could not find very many cases of mainstream political parties that sort of radically turned away from democracy. There are a few. We ended up uh, discussing a, a case in Thailand, um, but th there aren't a lot of examples. And the Democratic Party in the U.S. South in, in the era of Reconstruction is an example. The Democratic Party was not, I would not, by today's standards, was not fully democratic before Reconstruction. But it, uh, it turned it towards violence and the open use of, of fraud and other authoritarian measures uh, in, a, in a pretty radical way in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And so we thought it was it was useful to look at why that's the case. And our, our interpretation, which is hardly the only interpretation, but ours is that this was primarily a, a response to a perception of existential threat by the, the main constituencies of the Southern Democratic Party. What Reconstruction brought almost immediate widespread black suffrage. Uh, African-Americans were an outright majority in a small number of Southern states. They were a near majority in most Southern states. So combined with uh, with uh, with white Republicans, they could easily win elections. But not only that, uh, black suffrage meant a serious challenge to the entire racial order in the South. And that for many Southern Democrats was perceived to be an existential threat. That was That was just differences over tax policy or health care that was that was perceived to be an existential threat to their way of life and we saw that as the as what as fueling the democrats radicalization um the situation with contemporary republicans is is uh not the same it's very different in important ways uh but we think there are important lessons and parallels to be drawn thank you so much for that uh, Fr Francis Lee, um, uh, uh, Steve Levitsky has argued that the Republican Party has turned away from a commitment to liberal democracy. Um, to, to, to what degree does that uh, break from the historical pattern you note where uh, populism has had a great uh, sympathy among the American electorate, but has failed fundamentally to challenge institutions because it's operated within the two-party system, which has basically been committed to upholding the institutions rather than threatening them, uh, to, to the degree that the party itself has uh, turned away from those values, might the historical pattern change? I guess I, I, I disagree that the Republican Party has turned away from democracy. Not to say that there aren't elements within the Republican Party who have, but I see more internal complexity in the Republican Party on this question. I mean, certainly during the post-January 6th period, um, uh, there have been few profiles in courage um, among, re among Republicans. What I see, though, if I look to the Congressional Republican Party, has been regular politicians trying to hold their coalitions together in the recognition that most of Trump's voters are also their voters and that they cannot hold on to the offices that they currently that they currently hold if um, they lose those voters. So temporizing 
playing both sides, refusing to take clear positions, the uh, the general approach to Trump uh, uh, among congressional Republicans is to say no comment or I didn't see the tweet. Uh, only a relative handful actually echo Trump's rigged election rhetoric. The modal position among Republicans uh, in, after January 6th was to raise some questions about pandemic voting rules and vote by mail, and then to change the subject as quickly as possible. Although most Republicans can, voted to, uh, to uphold those objections to two states' electors on uh, January 6th, most House Republicans voted to do so. They knew so with certainty that their actions could not change the outcome with Democrats in the majority. Meanwhile, 85% of Senate Republicans rejected those efforts and voted to uphold the contested electors. So that's a divided party in my reading. Once the certification was done on January 6th, nearly all Republicans went on to participate in Biden's inauguration, which I see as quite significant. In doing so, they declined to attend a rally that Trump organized at Joint Base Andrews in order to compete with the inauguration. Virtually no one, no one went to that. That rally. So, uh, I, I I see the Republican Party as heterogeneous on this on this question. I also see the Republican Party has taken quite a, 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 it, the Republican Party in Congress as having taken quite a hard line on uh, the uh, on those who broke into the Capitol on, and rioted on January sixth, and have refused to lift a finger to to criticize any of those prosecutions. In fact, have demanded harsh prosecutions in those cases. So I, I see, if, you know, looking back to uh, what Steve identified as the three tenets uh, that a party needs to uphold in order to continue to uh, participate uh, as a uh, uh, as a democrat as a party in a democracy to accept the results of elections, um, to uh, reject the use of violence, and um, to break with extremists. I see them as meeting two. Of those criteria. I, uh, the Republican Party has not broken with extremists. And in fact, Republicans are not ruling out um, supporting Trump again, despite um, his action after uh, you know refusing to respect the, the, the elections, the 2020 elections, to this day refuses to accept um, the, uh, uh, the elections, that um, uh, uh, there is you know, no disavowing of Trump as leader of the party. Republicans, Senate Republicans held it in their hands to prevent a second Trump presidency um, uh, after the, uh, the impeachment, the second Trump impeachment, and they declined to do so. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I see them as failing on that third, but I don't, I don't see them as uh, an anti-democratic force um, in American politics. Uh, many thanks for that. Uh, Kurt, Kurt Whelan, your new book argues that uh, Trump's first term, his tumultuous passage through the presidency, left U.S. democracy uh, largely intact, or I, sh I should say uh, President Trump's term in the presidency less, left U.S. democracy intact, um, and that uh, checks and balances held firm, political competitiveness did not suffer any compression, distortion, or skew. And on the other hand, his populist challenges to U.S. democracy have had the salutary effect of shaking up political fatigue and mobilizing participatory energies among the Democratic Party and civil society at large. What, what If Trump were to be reelected, what would failure look like? Would you use uh, Steve Levitsky's three factors? And what uh, would be signs that um, the institutions had failed in a second term in the way that they held in the first so um, I think serious usage of the administrative state against the democratic opposition, you know, but um, I call it an article discriminatory legalism. So use the law in a discriminatory way against the opposition, um, put them on pressure, try to disqualify opposition politicians, um, put serious pressure on civil society, on journalism, on the media, which is Trump um, rhetorically berated people, attacked people, but you know um, many governments that really move towards authoritarianism use much more serious measures of bringing legal charges, bringing tax charges, using these kinds of things. So seriously undermining the effectiveness of the opposition or institutional changes that would do 
that would skew the playing field in the way that Steve, in his book about competitive authoritarianism with um, Lucan Bay, analyzed, you know, that then the, the electoral playing field is really not not um, even anymore, and there's a serious advantage of the incumbent party. So institutional change. Steve mentioned the downgrading of the United States in the number of international democracy ratings. And in my view, these are partly problematic and exaggerated. And I think that people often look at policy measures. Oh, so Trump was anti-immigrant and that's not very democratic. I mean, I think I think we have to look at institutional factors. We have to really be attentive to the procedures of liberal democracy. And I think there is in these international um, democracy rating efforts, I think there is sometimes conflation with policy measures. There's also, I think, a certain bias, especially when these measures are subjective, since so many of our political science colleagues have their heart beating on the left. I think it tends to be that right-wing governments tend to be judged a little more harshly. They're actually statistical analysis of, for example, VDEM ratings that show there is a significant, not huge, but significant bias against right-wing governments. And so in, in my view, the downgrading of the US during the Trump years has, um, I think, gone too far and is not quite deserved. Thank you for that. Uh, Steve Levitsky, your book ends in chapter eight, uh, democratizing our democracy with a series of proposals uh, to make America more democratic, uh, including uh, a series of voting rights reforms, uh, beginning with passing a constitutional amendment, establishing a right to vote for all citizens, automatic voter registration, and uh, so forth. You also would abolish the Electoral College, reform the Senate, replace first-past-the-post system so that majorities can uh, govern, uh, eliminate partisan gerrymandering, abolish the Senate filibuster, establish term limits for, for Supreme Court justices, and more. Uh, t t which of the, uh, an ambitious uh, series of reforms, many unlikely to happen, as you note, given the constraints of uh, the need for a constitutional amendment, um, how, how 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 many of these amendments if, uh, and reforms, if they passed, would prevent uh, populist threats to liberal democracy, and how many would not? I think most of them would not. I mean, all, all of us uh, on this Zoom are, to some extent, institutions. We believe that institutions matter, that the design of institutions matter, that the strength of institutions matter. But institutions aren't the whole, or never. The whole story. Uh, conflicts in society, polar, extreme polarization and violence in society can distort, undermine, even wreck a democracy, uh, no matter what the the institution. So there is no, I, I don't believe that there is any set of, of written down rules that can guarantee uh, a, a, a democracy. What, what, I, what the reforms, and so the the democratizing reforms that we lay out in chapter eight, I think, are, are very important in the mid in the medium term. They are first of all, they're obviously not going to be none none of them will occur prior to twenty twenty four, and they they don't resolve our immediate threats. The uh, resolving or dealing with the immediate threats to American democracy uh, involve measures that 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 uh, go beyond institutional reform, um, but. Basically, assuming that we, assuming that 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 Kurt is right, and that we muddle through 2024 and are able, even able to to muddle through a second Trump presidency, which may well be the case, we recommend a set of reforms that um, would bring us more in line with other established democracies in the world, in which electoral majorities routinely win power and are able to govern without threatening individual rights and without threatening the democratic process itself. So we are, the United States has over the last century gradually become an outlier in terms of the excessiveness of our, is that a word? Uh, the excessive nature of our, of our kind of majoritarian system. We are now the only presidential democracy in the world in which presidents are not directly elected with an electoral college. We have one of the most malapportioned senates in the world um, I guess, with the exception of Argentina and Brazil, we are the only established democracy with, in which a supermajority rule, this is not 
constitution, but a supermajority rule is employed for the passage of regular legislation. We are the only established democracy that does not have either term limits or a retirement age for Supreme Court justices. So, And we are one of the very few democracies in the world that doesn't have a constitutional right to vote. In every other democracy I know of, um, governments make it easy for people to vote. Governments want people to vote. So it's it's often a constitutional right. Uh, automatic registration when you're 18 is very common in democracies. Voting occurs on uh, on a Sunday or a holiday. The really the United States is one of the it's a it's a very strange case of a democracy in which has always been there have always been more obstacles to vote. Governments don't seem to don't work to help people vote. And um, so the, the reforms that we, again, we were under no illusion that this is going to happen overnight, but we think it's important to begin thinking about and publicly debating democratizing measures. The United States has a, even though our constitution is very hard to amend, we have a long history of working to make our political system more democratic. George Washington in, in 1787 wrote to his nephew that the Constitution was an imperfect document and would be up to future generations to improve upon it. And, and we did do that through the Bill of Rights two years later, to the gradual expansion of suffrage, to the very important reconstruction reforms, to the important reforms of the, um, uh, of the progressive era, direct election of the Senate, to the, the uh, improvements to our congressional elections in the 1960s, and obviously the civil rights reforms of the 1960s. The, the last half century, the last 50 years have been kind of unique in American history in that we've kind of stopped doing the work of making our democracy work better and making our political system more democratic. We've kind of froze things in the 1970s and have stopped discussing constitutional reform. And what I'm suggesting, or what we're suggesting, is getting back to an earlier American tradition of working, thinking about and working to make our system more democratic. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Francis Lee, um, the founders, both uh, uh, ha Hamilton and Madison and Jefferson, were afraid of populist demagogues in different ways. And when Jefferson got a copy of the new constitution, uh, he wrote to Madison that his main concern was that a, a, a illiberal president might lose an election by a few votes, cry foul, refuse to leave office, enlist the help of the states who'd voted for him, and install himself as a dictator for life. And Hamilton is afraid of majoritarian demagogues who like Caesar will be elected and then flatter the people. And uh, even though they've won elections will then uh, install themselves as dictators for life. Um, why was it that uh, the constitution which they designed to prevent that kind of populist demagogues uh, succeeded for so many years, um, and and why is it that uh, it's not uh, until uh, the election of President Trump that we're hearing claims that the system for the first time is failing? An interesting question. I mean, I would say that if you look back at U.S. history, there have been a, uh, a number of occasions when uh, presidents have pushed the boundaries of their power in ways that have provoked um, criticisms similar to those that Trump provoked of uh, uh, authoritarian ambitions. Uh, and the, so, I mean, that was true for FDR. That was true for uh, Theodore Roosevelt, certainly true for Andrew Jackson. So uh, I, I see Trump as being subjected to many of the same institutional constraints that have been important for restraining presidents through U.S. history. I would say that the Trump era has made me see the constitutional system in a new light and in engaging with the comparative literature, appreciate the two-term limit for presidents in ways that I hadn't previously, I hadn't previously seen how important that can be for protecting democracy. Um, and against personalistic rule, as uh, uh, as as Kurt defines populism, that 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 
um, that uh, the U.S. system seems to be uniquely well designed. Not only do you have all of those pre-existing um, uh, uh, institutional constraints that date all the way back to the founders uh, and their skepticism about um, about uh, unfettered democracy and the potential for populist demagoguery, but uh, in in at you know. Uh, b building on Steve's comments about the ways in which we've democratized the system, um, one we might also add is almost paradoxical, but you might almost add the um, the two term limit as another um, uh, institutional protection that was layered on after um, the original constitution was established. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Kurt Whalen. Would you see uh, President Trump in the history of American uh, populist? leaders like Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Franklin Roosevelt, who were also uh, charged with having demagogic ambitions, but were ultimately constrained by the system? Or is he an outlier? And what does the comparative perspective, which you explore in your new book, tell us about whether or not President Trump is an outlier? So I'm, of course, not a specialist in American yeah. politics and American history. Yeah. But I think there are many similarities to these earlier instances of populist leadership. You know, not, no wonder that President Trump had a painting of Andrew Jackson in his office as a kind of inspiration. And I mean, like those earlier incarnations of personalistic, charismatic leadership, Trump has also been um, constrained by this institutional framework. Now, Trump, of course, was much more of an outsider in many ways. And, you know, as Francis had mentioned before, it was in some sense a really terrible accident that he even made it to the presidency, you know, and it's in some sense the, the one loophole, the surprising openness and democraticness of primaries were also, of course, the Republican primaries were more open, not having superdelegates than the Democratic primaries. And so Trump can get into office in that way. And in that sense, not having risen through party politics and coming on as a complete outsider, in some sense, had more of a transgressive and aggressive um, attitude than earlier ones. And, you know, no respect for not only liberal democratic civility, uh, but also for institutional rules, institutional norms. So in that sense, I mean, in my view, he's a bigger threat than the earlier incarnations. But in a, in a comparative perspective, I mean, we've seen this coming from the left or from the right with Alberto Fujimori in Peru, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Viktor Orban in Hungary, Erdogan in Turkey, we've seen this kind of type of personalistic, domineering, headstrong leaders who have an anti-institutional transgressive bent and who draw on this plebiscitarian mass support, I think in many different incarnations. Very, a, a lot of political commonality, despite a lot of contextual differences in terms of politics, ideology, electoral base. And one thing that is, I think, very noticeable that these populist leaders are very skillful at stringing together very heterogeneous types of coalitions. I mean, Steve in the book emphasizes in some sense the impact of racial cleavages in the United States, but there are also a number of other cleavages that Trump appealed to, the culture war, economic dissatisfaction. And so these populists are based on a very heterogeneous kind of coalition that can come in with a good amount of you know, support and force and try to do this damage to democratic institutions. And fortunately in the United States with its strong institutional framework managed to contain that transgressive force. Thank you so much for that. Well, it's time for closing thoughts in this sobering and important discussion. Uh, Steve Levitsky, in uh, How Democracies Die, you identified four behavioral warnings that can help us know an authoritarian when we see one. They're, they're now famous. Uh, uh, we should worry when a politician rejects in word or action the democratic rules of the game. Two, denies the legitimacy of opponents. Three, tolerates or encourages violence. Or four, indicates a willingness to curtail the civil liberties of opponents. And in that book, you imagined an authoritarian leader standing at the helm of a party controlling both chambers of Congress and a majority on the Supreme Court, uh, politicizing election law and entrenching permanent control of the federal government. Uh, are you now more or less concerned uh, that we might see uh, a 
a, a president, uh, President Trump, if he's reelected, um, uh, meeting all four of those factors and why? Well, Trump clearly meets all four of those factors. I should, um, in fact, I, one thing that's occurred to me recently is I can't think of many um, candidates in competitive elections in the world since World War II who have been as openly authoritarian as Donald Trump. The the folks that, that Kurt mentioned who did much greater damage to their democracies than Trump, uh, Erdogan, Orban, Fujimori, Chavez, none of them in campaigns were as openly authoritarian as Donald Trump. None of them promised explicitly to go after and lock up their political rivals. I cannot think of many candidates since World War II who have been as nakedly authoritarian as Donald Trump. So we can't say we weren't warned. Um, I'm I'm more worried than than before. Primarily, the, the variable that's changed in the United States over the last, I guess it's seven years now, is the, uh, the, the almost complete Trumpization of the Republican Party. Uh, and here I differ with, with Francis a little bit. Um, it, it's those regular politicians who are not openly Trumpist uh, that make the difference. And those regular politicians in their silence, in their speaking out of the two sides of their mouth, in their not seeing the tweet, uh, and in their enabling of, in their, their quiet enabling of Trump's authoritarianism are excellent examples of what the great political scientist Juan Linz called semi-loyal Democrats. Mainstream politicians who enable the work of authoritarian forces. Authoritarians cannot kill democracies on their own. They can only do it with the, co the complicity, the cooperation of mainstream political parties. And in my view, the behavior of those regular Republican politicians, with a few very important exceptions, uh, since 2020 has been um, uh, has been very, very dangerous. And it's I, let me very briefly contrast this to Brazil after the 2022 election. Brazil had uh, its its Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, was very, very similar to Trump in many ways. He was not a very popular or effective president. He lost his reelection bid. It was a close race. He didn't want to accept defeat. He uh, tried to maneuver to 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 overturn the election. But unlike the United States, on election night, every major right wing politician in the country came out and said, those are the results. Lula won. Too bad. Look forward to working with him. Uh, on uh, on uh, Brazil had its version of January 6th, the takeover of all the major the, the, the presidential palace, the Congress. Uh, right wing politicians fiercely denounced the, the the violence and actually supported, unlike the United States, an investigation into the events of January 8th. And when the Brazil electoral court ruled that Donald, that uh, that Jair Bolsonaro would be prescribed from politics for the next eight years, right wing politicians basically accepted it. They didn't run around saying that they're that uh, that the uh, institutions of the Justice Department had been had been weaponized. So Jair Bolsonaro today is a fairly marginal figure in Brazilian politics, whereas Donald Trump is a Republican frontrunner for, for the presidency. So it doesn't have to be this way. Regular politicians can behave differently in ways that are much healthier for democracy. I don't think we're headed for fascism. I don't think we're headed for a consolidated autocracy. Our institutions, thank God, are too strong for that. But I think we're headed for a period of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of instability, at a fair amount of crisis, which could be accompanied by uh, by a fair amount of violence. Uh, uh, for, uh, forgive me for that. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, say that one more time and and, and note that um. Uh, Francis Lee, Steve Levitsky says that we can't say we weren't warned and he is more concerned because of the behavior of what he notes are semi-loyal uh, Democrats in being complicit in the backsliding into authoritarianism. What are your final thoughts? Are you more or less concerned about the prospect of democratic backsliding than you were four years ago? Uh, 
I, uh, my, my level of concern is the same, I would say. I mean, our institutions are, are the same. Um, they held last time. Uh, I see Trump is in some ways weaker this second time around. As uh, as Kurt mentioned, he is a lame duck, would be a lame duck from the start. I also foresee more trouble um, in staffing a second Trump administration, considering um, the the um, the fate of the careers of so many of those who served in Trump's first administration. That I think there'll be a hesitancy of regular Republicans to uh, to uh, to step into those roles. Uh, uh, there will be a regular, there will be regular midterm elections in 2026. I expect a very ferocious backlash um, at that, um, at that juncture. So, um, so I would anticipate um, uh, many of the same factors that were critical in uh, containing the, the damage to democracy after 2016 as being, um, uh, as being uh, important uh, should be, should the system be tested again. Many thanks for that. Uh, Kurt Whalen, last word in this in this great discussion is to you. Are you more or less concerned about the prospect of authoritarian and democratic back uh, sliding uh, now than you were in uh, 2016? I, I'm not concerned about authoritarian backsliding, but I'm concerned <clears throat> excuse me, about, <clears throat> about conflict um, that, sorry. I don't know. Must be Trump getting into my throat. Uh -huh. um, that that um, I think there will be a lot of trouble. I think Trump will be more aggressive, will be more determined to take revenge and to push his transgressiveness. But I think there is also learning on the other side, and so I I foresee a good amount of trouble. But that uh, I think that American democracy will once again survive fairly unscathed, and I I do think. There is this paradoxical um, effect that um, Trump's aggression does stimulate participation, does stimulate a certain rejuvenation of American democracy on the other side. I mean, we saw that in electoral participation and candidacies going up. And so it's not all bad what I think will happen. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, th and thank you, uh, Stephen Levitsky, Francis Lee, and Kurt Whalen for an extremely uh, significant discussion about populism and democracy. And thank you, dear National Constitution Center friends, for taking an hour out of your day to educate yourself about these crucial issues involving the Constitution and the future of democracy. Continue your education by reading the books of our great panelist, uh, Stephen Levitsky's Tyranny of the Minority, uh, Francis Lee's important work on populism in the American party system and Kurt Whalen's democracy's resilience to populism's threat countering global alarmism. Uh, thank you again and look forward to reconvening.